The streets hold many secrets. From alleyways in the heart of London to the quietest country lane, they've all witnessed cruelty and violence, jealousy and despair. They've seen crimes of passion and cold-hearted murder. They've seen killers escape, killers brought to justice. In this series, we'll be investigating the most notorious crimes and intriguing mysteries. Stories of men and women who killed, of the police who hunted them, and the victims who were left behind. From the files of Scotland Yard and far beyond, this is the dark history of our streets. <laughs> In 1802, a new spectacle came to Britain. A 40-year-old French woman arrived in London with a collection of wax sculptures. Marie Tussaud was her name. Her most popular exhibits from the very beginning were models of the infamous and the hated, guillotine royals, executed criminals. And when Madame Tussaud launched a permanent exhibition in 1835, they found a new home the Chamber of Horrors. Madame Tussauds came across to England as something that was a product of the French Revolution. She started the work at age seven, and by the time she was 17, she was actually modeling um, faces of the French aristocracy. Back in the 1830s, it was originally just a small separate room where she'd exhibit slightly darker material. But then she started introducing memorabilia and waxworks of British murderers. So you had the body snatchers, Burke and Hare. You had um, Marie Manning, who killed her lover in um, 1849. So from the very beginning, what made Madame Tussauds a popular visitor attraction in this country was the ability to use wax to create lifelike uh, displays of the sensational, the horrible, the grisly, the gruesome. For well over 150 years, the chamber was one of the most popular attractions at the museum. Dr. Crippen came there, as did John Christie and John George Haig. Alongside them for many decades was a notorious double killer, a killer who was as infamous as any of those others, a killer who some would even claim was responsible for the murders of Jack the Ripper. On the morning of Saturday, the 25th of October, 1890, Frank Hogg was a very worried man. The 31-year-old porter hadn't seen either his wife, Phoebe, or his 18-month-old daughter, Tiggy, since the day before. And nobody knew where they were. Frank had been at work during the day, and at 10 o'clock, he went home and Phoebe wasn't there, so he sat up until about two o'clock the next morning waiting for her to see if she was coming home. When she wasn't there on the Saturday morning, he just assumed that she'd got the train up to Chorleywood to check on her father, who was quite elderly and very ill. I find it perfectly credible that Frank will have presumed that that's where she has gone. 
As the hours dragged by, his fears began to grow. He gathered together his sister Clara and their elderly mother. They would canvass the neighbors while he hurried off to Rickmansworth to visit his wife's father. On the Saturday morning, various members of the Hogg family went off searching for Phoebe, kind of on the assumption that Phoebe had gone to Chorley Wood. I suspect that he went out in a spirit of self-righteous rage, planning to have a showdown with the family, because he'd been trying to limit her intercourse with her family so that you could only go there by invitation. He does then begin to think, well, if she hasn't gone to Chorley Wood, where would she have gone? But there was no sign of Phoebe or Tiggy at Frank's father-in-law's. He dashed back home. But by then, the news was all over the papers. A woman had been found dead in Crossfield Road, just a mile away from their home. Frank's sister, Clara, and a supportive neighbor were already on their way to Hampstead Mortuary. And it was just after 11 a.m. that they arrived there. At first, Clara and the neighbor did not recognize the woman on the slab. But Inspector Bannister, the lead detective, knew how different people could look in death, especially those who'd suffered violent ends. He urged the women to take a second look. Until then, Inspector Bannister had paid little attention to the young woman who had accompanied Clara, a family friend, he would thought, or someone there for support. Now, this neighbor lost all control. She clawed at Clara's arm, begging her to change her mind, to say she was wrong, that it was not Phoebe, that she had made a mistake. And this time, Clara knew. The woman lying before her was her sister-in-law. It was Phoebe Hogg. Her behavior goes beyond what you might have expected of a woman upset by seeing a, a dead body in such a state. She became more and more agitated. Don't look at it, don't look at it, don't touch it. And she kept trying to pull her away. And Clara kept saying, no, don't pull me, leave me alone, I, you know, stop it. And she said, no, no, it's not her, it's not her, come away, come away. And, uh, of course, rousing all sorts of suspicions by, by the police uh, as to her behavior. I think it would have been credible if she said, I cannot stay in here any longer, I cannot look. But the almost hysteria that she seems to have displayed, not over the state of the body, but come away, come away, that seems from the start to have roused police suspicions about the murder. The young neighbor was called Mrs. Mary Piercy. Within just a few weeks, her name would be known across the country and her wax likeness would be standing 
in Madame Tussauds' Chamber of Horrors. Before she was a convicted murderer, Mrs. Piercy was Mary Eleanor Wheeler. She was born in 1866. Her childhood home was a happy one. Mary was a kind, if sensitive, child, but she was also plagued by an undiagnosed and untreated illness. She had headaches, she blacked out, and she had violent fits. There is a story that when she was two years old, she was dropped on her head and suffered quite badly as a result of this fall. She was regularly complaining of, uh, of headaches. And some of the symptoms she displays are those of epilepsy. The symptoms that Mary was said to exhibit actually sound more like migraines or depression, not necessarily epilepsy. So it's not 100% that she did suffer from it, but certainly her family believed that she did. Epilepsy was regarded as a form of social stigma. If you were in the money classes, then epilepsy could be described and treated as a misfortune. If you were in the working classes, epilepsy was stigmatised as a form of criminality. The treatment involved cruel punishments, straitjackets, beatings, possibly electroconvulsive therapy. To have a member of the family who was labelled insane, mad, was something which affected the reputation, the respectability of the entire family. When Mary was 16, her father was killed in an accident at work. His death tore the family apart. Within a year, Mary had tried to commit suicide. She then moved out of the family home in East London. For five years, nothing was heard of her. Her family believed she was dead. In fact, she was still in London. She was living with a handsome carpenter named John Piercy and posing as his wife. Whether they were ever married or not, the relationship was an unstable one. She was 18, we believe. That seems to have been when the relationship started. They lived together and she took his name and presented herself as Mrs. Piercy. But actually they were just living in sin, which wasn't the most unusual thing in Victorian society, but it wasn't something that polite society did. After three years, John Piercy had had enough. He still cared for Mary. He thought her kind and gentle, but Mary was also a liar and a fantasist, and she had started seeing other men. One of them was a young man named Frank Hogg. Frank Hogg was a ladies' man. He reckoned himself to be something of a lady killer. He was very vain, and he thought that any woman who saw him must automatically love him. I think we have to accept that he must have had a degree of charm. He must have had a pleasant manner. It's very mundane, the beginning of her affair with Frank Hogg. Frank's father had run a grocery. When he died, his mother Mariah took it on. Frank worked for her as an assistant, and Mary was one of their customers. So she would have come into the grocers, got chatting with Frank, and a friendship, and then a relationship started that way. I suspect that the odds are that she, of course, had the advantage of being able to invite gentlemen callers back to her lodgings in Priory Road because she lives there alone. Frank 
has got a key to Mary Pierce's rooms. He can let himself in any time he likes. And the neighbors in the rooms above always knew him as Mr. Piercy. So there was an affair. The problem with an affair developing was his future wife, Phoebe. Frank's affair with Mary did not end his marriage, but nor did his marriage put an end to the affair. And Mary was determined to become part of the family. She invited Frank, Phoebe, and the newborn baby Tiggy to join her for Christmas in 1889. And when Phoebe fell suddenly ill a few weeks later, Mary saw her opportunity. When Phoebe doesn't recover from the post-pregnancy weakness, she falls ill in the January with probably the effects of the uterine abscess that is later discovered during the post-mortem. Accounts vary of how ill she was, how long she was ill, but certainly Mary was called on to come and help look after her. It's likely that she came in to help out as a family friend. By this time, Frank's mother was not in good health. So you've got Phoebe sick in one bedroom, you've got Mary has virtually moved in, Frank's at home. So again, it's kind of quite a self-centered nursing. Mary's there primarily because Frank's there and it's an opportunity to see him. Phoebe's recovery was slow, too slow, thought some of her family, who feared the hogs were ill-treating her. It was only when Phoebe came to stay with them that she made progress. But she was a married woman. She couldn't stay away from her husband forever. She returned to her difficult life in Prince of Wales Road. Phoebe was not a happy woman. Still weak from her illness, she found looking after her baby exhausting, especially with a gaggle of in-laws watching her all the time. She begged Frank to let them move somewhere new, somewhere they could make a fresh start, just the three of them. He refused. When they were married, they moved in with Frank's mother and her sister Clara. It's all a very crowded atmosphere, and with the baby as well, friction between the families was inevitable. His sister seems to have known all the time what was going on, monitored Frank's life quite closely, and also she seems to have been friends with Mary. So that would have caused an awkwardness anyway. We know that there were frequently fights, and it's highly likely that the Hogg family took Frank's side rather than anything else. As a result, Frank banned them from seeing Phoebe, banned them from his house. So there's kind of a schism there that he's not letting her see her family. And that must have been a source of stress for her and a source of tension between the two of them. We don't know how much Phoebe knew of Frank's affair, but she must have suspected something. She stopped responding to Mary's invitations. When she passed Mary on the street, she ignored her. If you think about the close confines of these families, the fact that Mary's coming and going out of the flat, the fact that she's there when Phoebe's ill, but doesn't seem to be there because of Phoebe, but because of Frank, Phoebe wouldn't have been unaware. She must have been aware of Mary's intentions towards her husband. Mary desperately wanted Frank for herself. Mary Piercy was little happier. A trip out of London with Frank in October 1890 was a chance for them to pose briefly as man and wife. For a few hours, Mary could indulge her fantasies, but they couldn't last. Frank had to go back to his wife and child, and Mary to her empty rooms. The trip only reinforced for Mary everything she lacked and everything Phoebe Hogg had. Two weeks later, Mary wrote a letter, summoned a boy, and paid him a penny to take it to Prince of Wales Road. We don't know what the letter said, but whatever Mary wrote, it was enough to lure Phoebe and baby Tiggy to her door. In 
investigation into the murder was moving quickly. Less than 24 hours had passed since the discovery of the woman's body in Crossfield Road. But Inspector Bannister of the Metropolitan Police had already identified the victim and a suspect. Nothing could be more erratic than uh, Mrs. Pierce's behavior after the murder of Phoebe Hogg. It's kind of planted the seeds of doubt in the police's mind about Mary because she was so insistent and trying to be so persuasive to Clara about the body, about it not being Phoebe's, that they're kind of thinking, hang on, why? Why are you so interested? Why are you so keen for it to be identified as someone else? What they do is they ask to visit Mary's lodgings. She seems to have quite cheerfully been willing to show them around her rooms. That's when things begin to go seriously wrong for Mary. In the parlor and bedchamber, everything appeared in order. The kitchen was another story. A window had been shattered, and recently too, for the broken glass still lay on the ground outside. And there was blood. It was splattered on the ceiling and the walls, on the windows and the floor. It was everywhere. This is not Mary's kitchen. This is the kitchen for the whole establishment. It's a shared kitchen. So there was no automatic reason that she might have expected them to ask to see the kitchen. What they then do is they examine Mary's kitchen equipment and they find, apart from anything else, the kitchen poker. The poker is covered with blood and matted hair. And when she's asked to explain, she just said, oh, killing mice, killing mice, killing mice. And she keeps repeating this. Mary's behavior has become distinctly suspicious. She goes into her living room, and she starts playing the piano and singing snatches of popular ballads of the time. That's what begins to convince Inspector Bannister particularly, that this is in fact a murder scene. It was more than enough for Inspector Bannister. He arrested Mary on suspicion of murder. She was transported to Kentish Town Police Station for questioning. He was certain Phoebe had met her death in that kitchen. He was certain Mary was involved. But did she act alone? And what had happened to baby Tiggy? The answer to one of those questions would come soon enough. Early on Sunday morning, a street hawker was walking along Finchley Road in North London. And it was there, hidden behind a hedge, and beneath a clump of nettles that he found the body of 18-month-old Tiggy Hogg. Although she was dead, she hadn't been subject to the same level of violence as her mother had been. She had been smothered, probably, but there was also some suspicion that she might have simply died from cold exposure. Obviously, she was fairly young and it was a cold night. Whether it was smothered at the time or not, we don't know, but there were no marks of violence on the body when it was actually found. As the bodies of mother and child were examined, the police gathered the rest of their evidence. They were certain 
that violence had occurred at Mary's home in Priory Street. Blood was found on dozens of items of clothing and furniture there, and attempts had clearly been made to clean some of them. Police also established that the pram found dumped two miles from Phoebe's body had belonged to the victim. Their experiments showed it was strong enough to carry the weight of an adult. The kind of pram that was used, the bassinet perambulator, they're quite big. I mean, they are not the modern, relatively small baby carriages. Bassinet perambulator is rather like a large basket with a hood at one end. She is seen on the streets by two, three people who know her. And uh, one person sees the weight of the bassinet perambulator, um, thinks that somebody is moving house. You've got so much stuff put in the bassinet. Quite a lot of working households who had perambulators of that nature used them for a whole variety of purposes besides baby carriages. Police also soon knew about the affair between Mary and the victim's husband, Frank Hogg. They found letters between them kept in a box under Mary's bed. And a key to her door was discovered in Frank's pockets. The evidence against Mary Piercy was totally overwhelming. The murder weapon, the bloodstained rooms, all of that pointed to her guilt. There's no sign that suggests that Phoebe Hogg could have been murdered anywhere but Mary Piercy's kitchen. That is why the evidence actually carries such weight, because no credible alternative is ever offered. There's all these bits of evidence that point towards Mary, but most importantly to Victorian society, once she'd been discovered to have been having an affair with a married man, I think public opinion was against her anyway. She was guilty in people's eyes, regardless of what other evidence there was. Despite it all, Mary Piercy insisted on her innocence. She offered no convincing explanation for the evidence against her, but nor did she incriminate anyone else. Investigators speculated over the involvement of her lover, Phoebe's husband, Frank, but they could find no evidence to back up their suspicions. Without the evidence to suggest the involvement of Frank Hogg or anyone else in the crime, Mary Piercy would face the charges alone. She would need money for her defense, and she had none of her own. Fortunately for Mary, there were those only too willing to help. What her mother had to do was to sell the objects from her daughter's two rented rooms in Priory Road in order to get money to pay for the defense. Now, in themselves, those objects would not have raised a huge amount of money. And then Madame Tussauds comes along and bargains to buy and bargains to buy at inflated prices. It was quite normal for Tussauds to buy exhibits relating to famous murder cases. When they could, they actually bought the clothing of, of the murderer themselves. This happened right up until fairly modern times. Madame Tussauds, faced with the opportunity to buy so wholesale stuff which is actually owned by Piercy, it can now create, as it does, a scenario full of items which it can advertise as genuinely belonging to Mary Piercy. Even as her trial began at the Old Bailey on the 1st of December, 1890, plans were being made to add Mary Piercy to the monstrous cast of the Chamber of Horrors. The 
trial of Mary Piercy began on the first day of December, 1890. She stood accused of the willful murder of Phoebe Hogg and the 18-month-old baby, Tiggy Hogg. The case was already a press sensation. The old Bailey's gloomy court number one was packed when the prisoner was brought up from the cells. The case caught the public's attention because of the supposed links with the Jack the Ripper murders. The suggestion was at the time, and has been since, that the brutal murder of Phoebe Hogg showed similarities to uh, the killing of Jack the Ripper's victims, the throat cutting and the abandonment of the body. This is all nonsense. Uh, there is no evidence to link the two cases, but at the time there was a fear that the Jack the Ripper murderer had moved from East London to North London, to Hampstead, to St John's Wood, Abbey Road. It catches the public imagination because it's such a puzzle. Mary didn't fit an image of what the Victorian sort of murderer should look like. You've got this contradiction between the crimes she's been accused of and the fact that she's a great reader of um, romantic novels. She, she's got a real sense of romance. She wrote lots of love letters to Frank that were read out in court. On the one hand, this is a woman who plays the piano, sings popular love songs, and on the other hand, you're expected to believe that she can pick up a kitchen poker and kill her rival, and then somewhere find the strength not only to slit her throat, but convey her victims' bodies in a perambulator. And pushing something like that's hard work. The Victorians couldn't quite understand this because is this due to passion or is it just that she's a psychotic individual? So there's all these aspects of her personality that really interest people. Mary entered a plea of not guilty, but she had left her defence little to work with. In all the weeks since her arrest, Throughout the inquest and committal process, she had refused to explain what had really happened, and she had rejected advice to seek the lesser charge of manslaughter. Mary Piercy was charged with murder, but that could have been dropped down to a charge of manslaughter, which would have meant that she would have escaped uh, hanging, but been confined uh, for a long period in a prison. It was believed at the time that fits of insanity could endow you for a time with an unnatural strength, a strength that you did not possess at any other time. So it would have accounted for her ability to have struck her rival over the head with a poker, slit her throat, stuffed the body in the pram and disposed of that. What it will have meant is that there was no intent because there was no sane intent. Her defence counsel were asking, if there's anything you know we can use to avoid execution, you know, let us know, but there was nothing, she said. As far as Mary's defence team was concerned, it was the obvious way to go. But from the start, this is blocked entirely by Mary. They are not allowed to go down that route. She will not accept it. And it raises the question, why? She didn't want people to think of her as having committed crimes under temporary insanity or as a result of her epilepsy. It's either that or she genuinely believed she was going to get found innocent and therefore she didn't need to um, go down the manslaughter route, uh, which suggests 
quite a confidence and a lack of understanding of the evidence against her. Mary's young barrister, Arthur Hutton, tried his best, but he called no witnesses and could offer no alternative explanation for the crimes. All he could do was remind the jurors that the evidence, though seemingly overwhelming, was circumstantial, and that with the death penalty hanging over Mary, the slightest doubt in their minds should outweigh it. Was this young woman so kind and gentle, according to all who knew her, capable of such violence? What motive did she have for the killings, and what did she stand to gain? It was a meagre strategy, and one that failed. On the third day of the trial, the jury delivered a guilty verdict. Mary Piercy was sentenced to death. I don't think there's any doubt that a guilty verdict would have been reached. The, the press was whipping up the story. It's interesting that the jury takes nearly an hour to come to its verdict. Now, cases at that time, which were clearly open and shut, juries could be in and out of their deliberations in 10 minutes. But in this case, it's 52 minutes. I think there was some doubt about her guilt purely because the public and the court couldn't understand that Frank wasn't involved. I think there's always been a tendency where women have committed crime that a man must have put them up to it or a man must have taken the leading role and the woman was just following him. Just a week after the judge had donned his black cap, a new attraction opened at Madame Tussauds. Mary Piercy was not yet dead, but the crowds were already filing past her waxwork figure in the Chamber of Horrors. She stood in an exact replica of her blood-spattered kitchen with her own table beside her, her own fireplace, her own clothes, and Phoebe Hogg's pram waiting nearby. The money from Madame Tussauds had helped pay for Mary's defense and they had not given up hope just yet. As the days counted down to her execution, solicitors were gathering new evidence about Mary's mental health, about her long history of fits and erratic behavior. They intended to petition the Home Secretary for a reprieve. The murders, they insisted, were committed in a moment of temporary insanity. Her solicitor, Mr. Freak Palmer, didn't think there would be the public sympathy for her to warrant a petition. He didn't think it would get enough signatures um, because people wanted to see her executed. However, he made a couple of efforts um, to get a petition raised. I think she was an intelligent woman. She certainly read the newspapers. She will have known that the violence involved meant that a reprieve was unlikely unless she was adjudged at least temporarily insane, and that she herself had rejected, had blocked that defence, and that it was unlikely to carry much credibility subsequently. He looked at um, whether she committed the crimes whilst she was undergoing an epileptic fit and had no memory of it afterwards. He also looked at whether it really was a premeditated murder or whether she had actually um, just been aroused by this temporary passion. And one of the, one of the strange things that was mentioned was whether um, she'd actually killed Tiggy at all, or whether she'd shown care for her, that the child had accidentally died in the cold. So there were attempts made and a submission was put to the Home Secretary, but ultimately this failed. Mary Piercy would go to the gallows. In her final days, she was visited again and again by her elderly mother. She pleaded with Mary to reveal anything she knew. If she was innocent, as Mary still insisted, then what had really happened? I think she genuinely did not know 
what had happened the night that she killed Phoebe Hogg. I suspect she genuinely closed her mind to it. It seems to me that she herself made up what she claimed to have happened because that in itself gave her comfort. She was used to living fictions and believing in them in her own life. The one person Mary wanted to see was Frank Hogg. Finally, a visit was arranged for the afternoon of December the 22nd, just hours before her execution. Frank never showed up. What she doesn't know, of course, is that Frank's family has withheld news that um, she'd asked to see him from him. For the Hogg family, the whole thing must have been a complete nightmare. The press absolutely tear his reputation to shreds, and by implication, um, those of his family. And when there came the final realization that he would never be coming to see her, she just broke down and just burst into tears. The next day, on a bitterly cold December morning, Mary Piercy was hanged. Whatever secrets she had, she took them with her. But she did have one last message for the world. On Christmas Eve, a curious advert appeared in the Spanish newspapers. It was placed by Mary Piercy's solicitor at her request. It addressed someone identified only by the initials M-E-C-P. It said, have not betrayed. What did it mean? We still don't know. Was MECP an unknown lover, an unidentified accomplice, or was the advert one last fantasy of an unwell mind? As the crowds stared at our waxwork in the Chamber of Horrors, Mary Piercy stared back. In waxen death, as in life, she offered no answers. <laughs> <laughs>